Welcome to Kubernetes. We're going to dig into building a DevOps pipeline. We're going to uh, start with nothing, and we're going to build up a website. We'll live code a Docker file. We'll live code a Kubernetes YAML file. We'll talk about best practices, both with Git and with Docker, and build up a DevOps pipeline in GitHub Actions that deploys this to Kubernetes. So I'm really excited. Um, and here's the code that we're going to look at today. There you go. Ta-da! It's empty. We're going to go build this. So if you want to grab this repository, here it is, github.com slash robrich slash level dash up dash github actions Kubernetes. But if that is too long, then let's head over to robrich.org, robrich.org. And we'll click on presentations here at the top. And here is level up your DevOps with GitHub Actions and Kubernetes. And a link off to the GitHub repository is right here. So robrich.org will get you straight there. While we're here on robrich.org, let's click on About Me and see some of the things that I've done recently. I'm a developer advocate for Shoreline. If you get a chance to stop by the booth, that would be a lot of fun. We're not going to talk about Shoreline today, but uh, I'm also a Docker captain. Microsoft has given me some awards as well. And I'm a friend of Redgate. AZ Give Camp is really fun. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities to build free software. We start building software Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver that completed software to charities. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ Give Camp. Or if you'd like a Give Camp here in Salt Lake or wherever you traveled from to get to this event, find me here at the event or hit me up on Twitter or Mastodon. The link's up here on the top. And let's get a Give Camp in your neighborhood, too. Some of the other things that I've done, I've uh, worked on a few books. Those were a lot of fun. Uh, I run the uh, Utah County .NET user group. I also run a .NET group in uh, Phoenix. Commuting is hard. And one of the things I'm particularly proud of is I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode. They read my comments on the air, and they sent me a mug. Woo! So there's my claim to fame, my coveted .NET Rocks mug. OK, so we want to deploy a website to Kubernetes. Well, the first thing that we need is a website. So I've got an empty folder here, and it's hooked up to this GitHub repository. I'm going to say .NET new. And if I say .NET new help, it'll kind of give, it, give me a .NET new. We could also do an NPX um, express and scaffold out a project there. Or we could build a Python API or you know, whatever we needed to. But .NET's right here. So I'm going to say .NET new MVC. Name is level up DevOps. And output is dot. If you want to follow along, you definitely can. If you've got .NET installed, then that's great. If you'd rather use Java or Python or that app you built yesterday, that's totally fine. So I added dash dash name level up DevOps and dash dash output dot. Both of those are optional. If I was in Visual Studio, those would be checkboxes. But the name gives me the name of the project here. So it is level up DevOps.csproj. And dash dash output puts it in the current directory. If I didn't have that, it would create a new folder inside that. So I would have, I'm in the demo folder. My project would be called demo and inside a second demo folder. So eh, I'll leave it out of there. Let's open that up in VS Code. And now that we've got our website, you know, this is a fully baked website here. Here's my home controller. I've got an action, an index action. I'll come into the views. Here's my index view. And instead of saying welcome, I'll say welcome to SLC DevOps days. Ooh. Ooh, required assets. Yes, I'll add them. That adds this .vs code folder that will help me debug things. Not necessary, but you know, it's kind of nice. Cool, we've got a website. Now, if I wanted to run this website, I would come here to the console and I would say .net run and it would fire up this website. It would go build the things and I could definitely push the play button in, inside Visual Studio or Rider or WebStorm if I wanted to. But now I, my website is running, and it's going to pop up Chrome in a second. And now I can go visit that website. And here's our website. Cool. I've got a home page. I've got a privacy page. I've got um, nothing else. 
<laughs> and here's that website that we just built. Cool. So our next step is working towards getting it in Git. So one of the things that we want to build here is a .git ignore file. I'm going to add a new file, .git ignore. And here in the git ignore file, we want to ignore everything that we don't want in our repository. Now there's a couple of uh, groups of things here. We don't want downloaded things. We don't want built things. We don't want temp files. We don't want user specific files. Specific. We don't want um, secrets. And these are kind of the five groups of things that we don't want in our Git repository. Now there are security concerns here. There could be um, user contention where I commit my preference and now you pull it and, and you don't want to do it that way. Well, and in particular, um, with downloaded or built content, it's big and it's going to change so frequently that it's like, well, I don't want my repository to get that big. Okay, first off, downloaded files. If I'm in a Python project, I have the .py cache. Oh, it's actually two underscores there. If I'm in a node project, I have the node modules folder. If I'm in a .NET framework project, I have the packages folder. Here in a .NET uh, core or .NET 7 project, we have none of that. So that's kind of cool. I'm just going to leave those in there. I'll leave the node modules in case I have some client-side stuff, maybe I have a React uh, spa built in it. Okay, built content. Now we have this bin folder. We definitely don't want to commit that. That's all the things that we got when we built last time. That's going to change all the time, and so we'll end up with huge pull requests just because we're doing that. Similarly, I'm going to ignore the obj folder. Here's the intermediate built stuff. I don't want that in my project. Temp stuff star.tmp, uh, star.log, star.orig. If ever you get in the middle of a git merge, you'll probably end up with .orig files if you break out of it. And so I might have a dist folder. In this case, I'll uh, leave that one out. But uh, that's all of the content that I don't want to commit because it's temp stuff. Next up, user-specific files. So I've got a star.csproj, that's the thing that I want, but then there's a .user file after that. We could also, in a node project, talk about package lock.json, and we can talk about if we want deterministic builds, in which case we don't want to exclude it, or we want to always get the latest security fixes, in which case we do want to exclude it. Um, we'll also have the .vs folder, this .vs code folder, we could choose to have specific uh, settings that we want in each place that talks to, am I using WSL to debug this, or am I doing it from an unusual path? In this case, we aren't changing it, so we'll leave that one out. And so we won't exclude it. Secrets. Okay, so I have a .env file in my Node project or my Python project. Um, Inside here, we have app settings.development.json. We might have secrets there. But I'm going to say, let's not put secrets here. I'm going to go into the regular app settings. This is the one that applies to all builds. And let's say that we need a connection string here. Here's a connection string for my DB. And locally, probably it's like server equals dot and trusted connection equals true, and maybe a database equals foo. Eh. We haven't added any secrets here, but I would also argue this is not the correct spot for this. Instead, I'm going to set this to use user secrets. Now the cool thing about user secrets is it creates a file inside your user profile directory that is far away from your code. So I'm going to come in here. I've got this VS Code extension installed that says user secrets. 
And because I have this extension installed, I can just right click on my csproj file and say, go to my user secrets, please. Now by default in .NET, a user secrets file ends up, oh yes, please create it, ends up as some random GUID here. We can see that that's a whole bunch of random goo. And if you've got that as your user secret and you're comfortable with it, that's fine. Uh, I don't, so I'm gonna pop open this. Here's this thing, and it just needs to be a unique string, so I'm gonna call it level up DevOps. Cool. I now have a unique string, so if I close this and open it back up again, I can, uh, inside Visual Studio, it's right clicking on the project, but inside VS Code, it's clicking on the CS proj, and now I have that connection string over there. It's not in my source control repository, it's over there in a really interesting spot. That's cool. So I've got my secrets here, and this also means that now if I start this without that user secret in, uh, in place, then my application is gonna blow up on startup. That's totally fine. It will tell me, hey, you need to use user secrets. And of course, I'm gonna be a good doobie, so I'm gonna uh, replace this with my actual connection string and, and then accidentally commit it, so um, thus the string that says, hey, don't do that. Cool. So we ignored appsettings.development.json, but here in our appsettings.development.json, we don't have secrets anymore. Our secrets got put into user secrets. We have default values here in our app settings that tell us that we've chosen to override them in interesting ways, but we don't have secrets in our repository. Excellent, so I'm gonna remove this. Now, you may have other secrets in interesting places. Maybe you have a star.cert, star.pem, star.key. Definitely keep your secrets out of source control. But now we've got a uh, .git ignore file that ignores those five things that we want to exclude. Downloaded content, built content, user-specific files, temp files, and secrets. These have no place in our repository. These are security concerns or they'll add to repository bloat and we just don't want them in our repository at all. Any questions so far about the app we've built? Cool. So our next step is containerizing this application. To do that, we need a docker file and a .docker ignore file. Okay. New file .docker ignore. Now the cool thing about a .docker ignore file is it has nearly identical syntax to the .git ignore file. So, let's go grab this and let it set it there. We've got a docker ignore file. Woohoo! There's one more piece that we need to add to our docker ignore file, and this sixth group is non-production files. Now there are some development files that are really helpful for us, but we don't want those anywhere near our production container. So, non-production files. We've got app settings. Dot development dot JSON. Thank you, uh, GitHub Copilot, for that. And we have this really cool thing right here, launch settings.json. Launch settings.json in .NET is all of the files that we need to be able to debug this. So here's the environment variables that we need to set. Here's the uh, application URL we should start. Should we launch the browser? Do we want to run in HTTP or HTTPS mode or in IS Express mode. Uh, we probably don't need that anymore. And so this is not a production file. Let's exclude it from our production container. Now the one difference between .git ignore files and .docker ignore files is in .git ignore files, it looks recursively in every directory for this content. In a .docker ignore file, it presumes that it's in the root directory. And this one is not. So let's say, go find that in any directory. Now we could definitely say, well actually this is in the properties 
directory, but uh, I kind of like just saying any directory. To that end, maybe we want to change all of these to any directory. Um, if you said, I've got multiple projects, I'm going to say, well, I want to ignore all the bin and obj folders. If you happen to put logs in interesting places or test results in interesting places, I'm going to ignore those. The .user is uh, specific to each project, so I'll ignore that. And now we've kind of ignored all of the things in all of the places in the way that a Docker ignore file works. Now, yeah, I wish they used exactly the same syntax. <laughs> they don't. Bummer. OK, we've got a Docker ignore file. This is everything that will not get copied into our container, even if we specifically ask it to be copied into our container. I hope that saves you the hour that it took me where I'm like, Copy, copy, <laughs> and it just didn't. I'm like, ah, I told it not to. Okay, next up, we need a Docker file. New file, Docker file. Now, it's important that this be named Docker file and not dockerfile.txt. So if you created this inside of Visual Studio or inside of Windows, and it said, hey, let me help you with that, we can remove the .txt and just call it Docker file. Now, I have the VS Code extension here for Docker. And because I have that Docker extension, I also get this really cool icon here. It's also going to help me with some IntelliSense, which is cool. And so uh, now we have um, interesting icons. But if you don't have that extension installed, it'll work just fine. OK, we need to build up the Docker file. Now, this Docker file is the infrastructure as code that explains how to package up our application. These are all the steps we need to take to get from our source code to a running container. So we have four main verbs here. From, copy, run, and CMD. There are other Docker commands, and we will see some more today. But if you understand these four Docker commands, you can pretty much read and write every Docker file ever. That's really cool. Now, these first three happen at build time. By the time I build my Docker image, all of these are done. When I start my container, I will run this line, and it will launch the process that I want to take to get that image to be a container. So let's start with from. OK, so let's head off to Docker Hub. I'm going to come here to Docker Hub. I'm going to search for .NET. I'll land on this meta repository that tells me about all of the different .NET repositories that allow me to pull my base image. Yeah, if I was in Node, I would look for Node. If I was in PHP, I would look for PHP. If I was in Java, I would look for um, .NET. Was that only funny to me? OK, so here's the repositories that we can look at. .NET samples is great. There's lots of base uh, Docker files that you can take a look at and go, yeah, that's kind of where I wanted to go. And it kind of gets you past the blank page, which is really cool. Monitor is a container that allows you to watch .NET apps. That's really fun. Runtime depths is what I would need to install .NET, but .NET itself is not installed yet. Built on top of that is the runtime. This includes the ability to run .NET console apps, but not websites. Built on top of that is ASP.NET that allows me to run websites, but not build content. And built on top of that is the SDK that allows me to build things. So let's start with the SDK. And I want to build from here. Yeah, I could definitely do something like this, where I could say .NET build, and then .NET test, and then .NET publish, and then copy that publish directory into my container. But I really want to build in a neutral environment. I want my CI system to be you know, completely separate in this isolated place. So I'm going to choose to build inside the container so that I know that I have this unique, untarnished environment. Cool. .NET SDK. There's the version that I want. We are using 
.NET 7 in this case. So as I cruise down through the versions, I want to find a .NET 7 one. Here's 7. And this one's built on top of Debian. Now Debian isn't a bad OS. It's, it's a great Linux distribution. That's great. But um, Alpine is really small. Really small. A few hundred megs. Dozens of megs. I like that. Having a smaller base image means every time I launch this container on any node inside of Kubernetes, there's less things to download if I haven't downloaded it before. So I'll have a faster startup time, not because my image is built differently, but because I have less layers to pull, less content in each layer. So I'm going to use the Alpine base image. I'll use 7.0-Alpine. And so let's say from that-Alpine. Cool. I've got the build tools in my container. I'm ready to go. Next up, copy. I want to copy everything from the current directory where I run my docker build command into the current directory inside of my container. Well, what is that current directory? Let's set this here. Workdir is src. Now, I could definitely put this wherever I wanted. var lib foo bar, and it will recursively create and then cd into those directories. But eh, src is fine. Cool. So I just copied all of this content into this Docker image at this layer, except for everything that we chose to ignore. And now that I've got all my content in place, now we need to run some build commands. So what we did here on the console to build it was we said .NET build, .NET test, .NET publish. Let's do that. .NET build, and I'm going to build in release mode. In uh, .NET 8, release mode will be the default here, which is really nice. In .NET 7, it still builds in debug mode by default. So I'm like, I really want those production optimizations. OK, .NET test. I'm going to also test in release mode. Now I don't end up with one debug build and one release build. Now, depending on my project, I may need to run some more integration tests. So maybe I need to specifically ignore some things. Uh, there's a really cool flag in here to say, um, not no build, uh, to only run tests tagged in a certain way. So I tend to run uh, only unit tests, not integration tests. So I'll filter those out. Then let's .NET publish. And I'll do this in release mode again. And I'm going to go to the dist folder. Cool. Now, this step right here is the similar thing that we would do to say, you know, webpack build or um, right click publish inside of Visual Studio. But we're doing it here in a DevOps pipeline so that it will be in identical every time. And the cool part is if this command fails, we'll stop. So the only way to get a completed image is to pass all the unit tests. It's kind of a nice validation. Cool. So right now, these are all just console commands. We need to run them as Docker commands. So let's come grab this, and we will run this one, and we will run this one, and run this one. That's cool. <laughs> now we've got all of these as Docker commands built inside of our Docker file. Yeah, we could definitely do this. And this, to reduce the layers, I'll come back to why that may not be important in, uh, later. But now we've got our app. It's built. It's in this dist folder. So let's change our work dir to dist. And then what command do we use to start it? Let's say .NET level up devops.dll. It's in the dist folder now. Now, we do need to set some environment variables. Let's come to our launch settings.json. Here's ASP.NET Core environment. Now, in development, we wanted that to be development, but here we want it to be production. We also want to set the ASP.NET Core URLs. We'll set this to uh, HTTP all IP addresses 80. And we do have this other environment variable, mydb here. So let's set that as well. And so let's say env uh, my db. Actually, we need to say connection strings my db, but 
colons don't really work in environment variables, so we'll just do two underscores and that works just fine. Uh, connection strings. And in this case, I'm gonna set it to blank because I want you to inject that in as you start up the app instead. So this is kind of that flag to say, hey, um, add this in Kubernetes, please. Again, I've left myself some trails to say, uh, this is where we inject the thing. So, you know, those two are probably okay, but in vars set by KDS. You know why we call it KDS? Yes. K, a bunch of letters, S. Kubernetes. Yeah, so Kubernetes is K followed by eight letters and then S. Internationalization. Accessibility. Wow, we're lazy. Cool, so we've got a Docker file. Now the cool part about this Docker file is this Docker file would completely work in production. We could use that today. But we've broken some of the rules of thumb of Docker files. One of the rules of thumb of running containers in production is that we don't want build tools inside of our production container. This is an additional attack surface that users might uh, compromise. If they are able to pop our container, upload their own code, recompile it, now they can take advantage of this environment and start to compile their own stuff. Now, that's not good. If we're in a node environment, maybe we want to, uh, we have to include the node executable, it's an interpreted language, same with Python. But if we're in Java or Go, we don't need those things. If we're in React or Vue or Angular, we're going to upload JavaScript, not Node. So let's get rid of our bull, uh, <laughs> Docker pull. Let's get rid of our build tools. So I'm going to split this image in half. I'm going to come back here to uh, Docker Hub. Let's take a look at ASP.NET. That's the runtime, but not the build tools. I'll grab this uh, image. We'll also see that there is an Alpine version. So let's split this in half. Let's say from ASP.NET 7 Alpine. So I'm going to call this one the production runtime image uh, server image, and I'll call this one the build server image. Now I put server in air quotes because it's not really a server, it's a Docker image, but we can kind of think of it like that. This part is the build server with all our build tools on it. This part is the runtime piece that doesn't have our build tools on it. We just created a multi-stage build it will build two different images. Now at the end of the day, the one that we're gonna tag and deploy is this one, so the fact that it, there are other things in it is interesting, but that's not super relevant to us. That's the one that we want. We will build this one, but then we'll throw it away. But now, we need to copy our content into place. So I'm gonna copy the content from the dist folder into my current folder, but now it's gonna look for a dist folder out here. That's probably not great. I don't want a dist folder out here. I want the dist folder from over here. So let's name this one as build, and I will copy this one from equals build. So I copied from the previous stage that dist folder. So this will reach over into the build stage, look for the dist folder, and copy all of that into the current folder. Cool. Now we've got a Docker file that will build a production image that does not include build tools. Now another thing that we can do is take advantage of layers inside of Docker. If we're building this locally, each command in our Docker file will create a new layer 
and that layer will be cached separately. So if we say, I don't know, let's come in here and we'll change some JavaScript code, it's gonna invalidate this layer right here. Now probably the slowest process of this build is uh, this one, I missed one, .NET restore, and that .NET restore will go download all of my dependencies. So I'm gonna change one little JavaScript line or even one little C-sharp line, and now I'm going to re-download my dependencies. I really want to do this here. That way, it will restore the dependencies and then cache them. Then I'll copy all my content. Then I'll build, test, and publish. Cool. Now, we still do need to copy in our manifest. So let's copy levelupdevops.csproj into the current folder, the source folder. Then we'll .NET restore. Now we've cached that layer. Now if I change a, a JavaScript file or a CSS file locally, it will invalidate this layer and then I need to only build, test, and publish. So we've taken advantage of Docker caching to be able to layer these in exactly the right way so that it will rebuild faster locally. Now on our continuous integration server, we definitely want to start over. So we'll probably want to pass in dash dash no cache into our Docker build, do those things to make sure that we re-grab all the dependencies here, grab all the security updates uh, based on Semver, and pull in the latest versions. We could also take advantage of this to say, I want to combine these layers together. And now it will cache all of these as one layer and then um, not need to cache each layer separately. This is a great technique if I want to app get something, or in this case, I'm inside of Alpine, so I want to APK. APK add something, and uh, rm minus rf, the cache directory, which I forget where it is, there it is. And so that's a great way to combine those two things into one layer so that I don't have cruft sticking around. In this case, I'm not gonna do that, but build, test, and publish, this is not our production image, so eh, I kind of like having them separate. Definitely personal preference, run this and run this, and I'm going to remove my continue this on the next line command. Cool, now we have a Docker file that takes advantage of best practices of keeping our build tools out of, con out of our production container and leverages the Docker layers to be able to cache this image more effectively. Now another thing that we probably ought to do is user, set this to a non-root user, but I'm gonna skip that today. Cool, Docker files. Any questions on our Docker files so far? Why did I what? Why did I hate jump? Why do I hate Java? Eh. Java is great. It can accomplish some really cool things. Sometimes. Yeah, I was just teasing. Java can be an awesome language. Is there a question over here? Yep. So run runs a command from the console. CMD also runs a command from the console? Good question. So what's the difference between run and CMD? Don't they like do the same thing? This is running a console command. And this is running a console command. Aren't those the same? Great question. This one runs a console command as I'm building up the image. It's gonna do it ahead of time, so that by the time I've got that fully built image, it's already done. By comparison, this one is gonna run at runtime when I start up my image as a container. So I'll only ever have one CMD line. You might also look at an entry point, but um, for our purpose today, they are synonyms. They're not, as you peel the onion. But we'll all end up with one CMD line, which is the thing to start up as I start my image as a container. All of these are how I build up my image to get to that final product. Build time, run time. Great question. 
Yes. Yes, what am I doing here? Copy dot dot. Copy from the directory where I'm running my docker build command to the directory, the current directory that I specified, in this case, the SRC directory. Yes. This is the inside directory. This is the outside directory. Similarly, here's only one file from the outside directory coming to the inside directory. Similarly here, here's the outside environment variable, and here's its value set inside the image. Yeah, great question. What's really interesting is copy dot dot, which doesn't work at all. You need a space there. Hope that saves you another hour. Cool, so here's our Docker file. So now if we wanted to test this out locally, we could say docker build. Um, I could give it a name like level up dev ops v0.1 dot. That's the uh, directory where I'm running this docker build command, that dot. And so that, because I'm inside the demo folder, is this demo folder so that then that aligns with this dot to be able to copy the content in. Now, I'm not going to build it locally, but uh, if I did shortly after doing that, it would show me all the build steps. And I could say docker run level up dev ops v0.1. And then it would be running. And I would go to localhost, and I would go, ah, I can't connect to it. <laughs> well, why not? Well, the beauty of Docker is it creates this network this software-defined network where everything inside the containers is kind of on the LAN side, and everything outside the containers is kind of on the WAN side, and I haven't described how I want to get traffic from here to there. So let's do that. Docker run dash P, I'll say um, 80 on my local machine goes to 80 inside the container, and I'll say level up dev ops v0.1. Cool. Now I hit localhost and the website pops right up. If you've got Docker running locally, then that's a great way to be able to build and test your product locally. But we want to launch it inside of Kubernetes. Any questions before we dig into Kubernetes? Cool, Kubernetes. Let's Kubernetes all the things. Every time I teach this Kubernetes uh, workshop and we get to Kubernetes, not that, we get to this. Every time somebody introduces Kubernetes, they start with a diagram like this, they show all the boxes, and they say, uh, see, explained it. Kubernetes makes sense, right? I have no idea what this means. Let me describe this diagram in the first and last time you'll ever care about this. As a developer, I connect with the Kubernetes command line, kubectl. Some people like to call it kubectl or kubectl. I don't know if I really want to be that cozy with my code. But OK, so the kubectl command line connects to the API server. The API server is going to persist that command inside etcd, the database. And then we've got the controller manager that's going to watch etcd looking for things that it needs to do. So the controller manager will watch the notice that I just made this command. The controller manager will uh, tell the scheduler, hey, we've got to launch something. So the scheduler is going to pick one of these nodes. On top, the green ones, this is the Kubernetes control plane. Down here, here are the worker nodes. The uh, places where we're doing our work. This is Kubernetes keeping track of itself, and this is 
us doing our work. So in this case, the scheduler is going to pick this blue node. That's one of the computers in my Kubernetes cluster. It's going to talk to the kubelet. It's going to say, hey, can you spin up a pod? Here's that pod. It spins up a pod. Pod is a networking wrapper around a container. We can kind of think of them as synonyms at this point. Now, a user is going to come in. They're probably going to hit a load balancer. We'll direct them to kube proxy on this particular node. They'll get forwarded to that pod. They'll be able to see the traffic. We might have C advisor running that's going to harvest the details of our pods and write that back through the API server to etcd. See, I explained it to you. Yeah, that's the first and last time you probably ever care about it at that level. The punchline here, though, is Kubernetes gets microservices because Kubernetes is microservices. It's made up of lots of these little replaceable pieces that I can choose to swap in with other things. So maybe I want to swap out my C advisor with Datadog. Or maybe I want to swap out my ingress with ngrok. That's completely possible in Kubernetes. And because Kubernetes gets microservices, Kubernetes is going to run great with my microservices too. So taking a step um, right there, we'll look at a couple of pieces. We're going to take a look at pods, which is a wraparound containers. A service is a load balancer across all of those pods. It will round robin by default, but it has ARR affinity, sticky sessions. We could choose to swap out the service with one that acts differently. Maybe we want to use Istio to be able to take more control over how traffic routes the services. Then we're going to have an ingress, which maps DNS to a particular service. So that one will be able to highlight the details of our app. And a user then will come in with, say, example.com. They'll hit the ingress, and the ingress will route that to the service. The service is going to pick the pod, and the pod will route that traffic into the container. So we need to build up an ingress, a service, and a pod. But probably we're going to not create a pod directly. Probably we'll create a Kubernetes deployment. And that will allow us to do some interesting things. So let's create this new file. And I'm going to say kds.yaml. And realize that I forgot to set up my cheat sheet. Cool. OK, I've got the Microsoft uh, Kubernetes extension. And the cool part about the Microsoft Kubernetes extension is it allows me to scaffold Kubernetes YAML files really easily. So I'm going to scaffold out a deployment. Cool. Typing all of that is kind of a mess. you know. Uh, Kelsey Hightower is famous for talking about how Kubernetes YAML format was meant to be a compile target and not to be the thing that we do. But then we forgot to build the compiler, so we still do this. <laughs> if you squint real hard, it's like, well, I've got a lot of foreign key things happening here. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to call this Level Up DevOps. Um, I've got some labels. I'll give it a version. But I'll just call this image label, image label. Um, I've got an image. Let's call this Level Up DevOps v0.1. Well, nah, nah, image label. And that will pull from my private registry. And I can set some resource limits. In this case, I'm going to leave it out. And what port does it forward into? Well, uh, I saw here in my Docker file that I told it to listen on port 80. So my container port that I want to forward into is port 80. Cool. Let's wire up those pieces. I'm going to call that version instead. And I will also set the replicas. Now, if I was using a horizontal pod autoscaler, this would be cool, and it could automatically go bigger and smaller. In this case, I'm going to hard code it at a completely ineffective one, just because I don't need a lot of them. One is probably sufficient. Eh, maybe two. That works. Cool. We've got our deployment. 
Now the cool part about a deployment is it is basically a recipe for how to create pods. This template says, here is the pod definition. Now I wish we could reference it from somewhere else. If we wanted to get fancy there, we could definitely pull in Helm, but at this point, we probably don't need it. So I've got my deployment. Next thing I want is a service. Yes, let's create a service, thank you. There's my service. My selector is that particular app. I want to accept traffic on port 80 and target port 80. Uh, I might also flip this to a node port and now I get an external port that we can route to. This can be really great for debugging because by default, this is only a local port that we wouldn't reference at all. But since I'm done debugging, I'll just leave this as the default of cluster IP, or in this case, I'm just gonna leave it off. Cool. So this is that service that's gonna round robin across all the instances, and it knows which instances it needs to connect to because this selector app matches this label app. Now there are other labels. We have an image label here, and that's interesting, but it's just gonna look for things that match on these hardware tags. Now we could definitely include other hardware tags. Let's say company is Acme, and project is Foo, and we can add as many hardware tags as we need. And if we wanted to then get more specific, we could also include those here in the selector to say, and these are the pods that you need to connect to. I'll also put them in the match labels here so that the deployment knows what things it's connected to. Cool, hardware tags. In our data center, we were adding hardware tags for all the things, you know, just key value pairs to help us identify what department it belongs to, who should we blame when it goes down, who's responsible for fixing the thing, and, and so you know, those hardware tags are cool. I'm gonna delete the extra hardware tags because we don't need all of those in this case. We're just building one. Cool, so we have the deployment. We have the service. Our next step is to set up an ingress. So let's add an ingress. And an ingress is going to match a particular host. So let's say levelupdevops.aks URL to a particular service. So what's the name of this service? Well, this service is Level Up DevOps. What port number is that service listening on? In our case, it is port 80. Cool. I'm gonna name it something different than my ingress. I'll call it Level Up DevOps. And let's put the labels there too. And one more thing is I want to add some annotations because this will tell Azure that I would like to use HTTP application routing. I might choose another ingress if I wanted to. Maybe I'm using external DNS inside of AWS. In this case, I'm using HTTP application routing inside of Azure. Cool. Um, I'm not using the beta namespace. That looks great. So we have our ingress. The ingress is gonna match the user's DNS query to a particular service. We have a service that is gonna load balance across all of our pods, and we have our deployment that will create the pods, and in this case, we've chosen to create two of them. Cool. Kubernetes. Any questions so far on Kubernetes? So what's with a question here? Yes. Good question. Do I have to deploy the ingress and the service every time? If I already had them installed, could I just use the ones that are there? Yes, I could. And in fact, uh, one of the things that I glossed over here is that this selector selects all the apps for level up DevOps, not all the apps for this particular version. So what we'll see when we kubectl apply it is that the service doesn't change the next time. One of the reasons that I like including it here is because the first time, maybe it isn't there yet. Or maybe it's evolved a little bit since. And so I kind of like having it 
just right here to make sure that all the pieces associated with my app are deployed together. But ultimately, if there are some configs, maybe you have config maps or secrets, that you probably do want to keep in the ops repository, not in the development repository, because maybe there's some secrets there. And so, yeah, you might want to separate some pieces. Ultimately, yeah, it's user preference. Good call. Other questions right here? Yeah. For the ingress, you said you could, it's modular and you could swap in whatever you want. Is that a simple thing to do per application, or does it have to be one ingress for the entire Kubernetes cluster? Good question. Do I need to use a particular ingress for each application, or can I set the ingress in the cluster? If I set it in the cluster, must I use that ingress for the cluster? Probably you're going to want to use one ingress for the entire cluster, one type of ingress. So I want to use ngrok, or I want to use nginx, or I want to use Envoy or Istio. And then it's probably easiest just to leverage the one that's there. But you don't need to. I could put in extra annotations that say, no, actually, the ingress type that I want is this. For an example, in this case, I said, I want the ingress to be provided by Azure. I don't want to have to worry about it at all. But yeah, that is a deployment specific concern, an ingress specific concern that you could choose to set as your default across the entire cluster. It's probably simpler that way, but not necessary. Is it easy to switch after the fact? Is it easy? Is it easy to switch? Yes, I just add an annotation that says, uh, by the way, my ingress type is this now. And then it'll switch. Now, some variables don't allow you to switch at runtime, in which case you have to quickly delete and then recreate the ingress. But eh, I suspect you're probably going to be fine. Thank you. And I'm about 60% confident in that opinion. I think I'm going to take you up about 20% of the time. <laughs> awesome. So here's Kubernetes. Now, one of the things that we did as we did GitHub, as we did our Git ignore file, is we ignored downloaded content, built content, temporary files, user-specific files, and secrets. One of the things that we have here in this thing is our Azure URL, our Kubernetes cluster URL. We also have the URL of our private container registry. These are things that I don't want inside my source control system, so I chose to put in environment variables that I'll swap out at runtime. Same thing with the image label. I want that to be the version of this container that I built. So yeah, I can't just kubectl apply this YAML file without swapping out those runtime dependencies. But maybe I have a, a development time YAML file that adds those particular things, or maybe I'm using a, a, the same sed command that we'll see in a minute that swaps these out at development time to be able to leverage it. Or maybe I'm just using Docker desktop and, and de debugging these in, de in Docker mode rather than going all the way to Kubernetes mode. Cool. So we want to add one more file here. We're going to add a new file, readme.md, because every GitHub repository is good at that. And let's go grab a readme file. Cool. Now let's commit it. Now I'm here inside VS Code, so I'm going to come in here and uh, switch over to the source code mode. I can take a look at the old and new versions and kind of compare which lines I've added or removed. Now in this case, I've created all of the files, so uh, maybe that view is a little bit less helpful. But cruising down this list, let me look at, you know, I want to exclude built files. I want to exclude downloaded files. Oh, bootstrap. Hmm, we've got a bunch of downloaded libraries that I 
kind of don't want in my repository. Now, these are referenced here by my views. So if I come in here to my layout view, we've got a reference to Bootstrap. Let's come over here to CDNJS, and we'll go look for Bootstrap. And here with this Bootstrap library, I would like to use this from a CDN. Let's copy that script tag and set that in place. Now the cool part is it has all of the cross-origin anonymous, refer policy, no refer, integrity. So if my CDN gets hacked and I'm now loading random scripts from random places, this script won't load correctly. Now if I'm running a local thing, if I'm running it inside my firewall, the uh, content that I serve locally will probably be faster. But if I'm running it on the internet, they're going to get it from a geo-located version close to them. And by the way, I'm using somebody else's bandwidth. I kind of like that. So we've swapped out Bootstrap here. Oh, that's the script file, not the CSS file. Let's go grab the CSS file here. Um, Bootstrap.min.css. And if I wanted to get really fancy, bootstrap.bundle.min.css would give me all the things. I've got that there. Let's go grab the script for this here. Copy that. Set that here. Um, I've also got some jQuery because, of course, I do. So let's go grab jQuery and swap in that jQuery script, I probably also need the, um, the script from Poplar. That's not it. The um, other thing that jQuery needs, but oh, I've upgraded my Bootstrap version. Excellent. There's one more spot here in my validation scripts where it pulls in jQuery validate and jQuery validate intrusive for some reason. So let's swap those out with um, things that I get off CDNJS. Cool. And now I can come delete this whole lib directory. Delete. Yes, please. Let's double check that we don't have any lib references in our source code. Um, yes, the compiled, oh, <laughs> it's in the libs folder in CDNJS. That's awesome. Cool. So back here in our code commit window, I really like to get comfortable with this view. Let's audit ourselves as we're crafting our commit. This is the story that we want to tell to our fellow developers. This is the work that we've created to build up this solution. So let me take a look at each file. Did I change the right things? Did I change some white space that doesn't make any sense? Do I have any built files, downloaded files, user-specific files, temp files, or secrets in here? Nope. Uh, let me double check my app settings. Nope, no secrets there. Uh, no secrets there. I used user secrets for the win. And so it looks like we've got some really good code. I'm going to say level up dev ops and I'm going to commit it. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to stage it. And then I'm going to commit it. Now VS Code isn't the only um, tool for committing. You could also come in here and say git add specific files and then git commit dash m my stuff, and that would work too. Cool. Git status. Nothing to commit. Excellent. Git log dash dash one line. Uh, ooh, awesome. We've got some stuff to push. Git push origin main. Um, by the way, in case of fire, get push and then tweet about it. And thus, my commit was helping me force push. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to force push in this case. 
But OK, so now we've got our content up in this repository. If you've been waiting for the source code for what we were going to build today, here it is. We just built that. That's cool. OK, we built our application. We built up a .git ignore file. We built up a Docker file that allows us to package that application into a container. We built up a Kubernetes YAML file that allows us to deploy that to Kubernetes. And now we want to build up a DevOps pipeline that will allow us to do that in a very repeatable way. Now, we could definitely use Jenkins, Team City. Um, we could use uh, Azure DevOps. Azure DevOps is really fun. Um, but in this case, I'm going to use GitHub Actions. AWS pitched us their cloud build, which is also really cool. Now here I can say uh, I could create a completely blank one. That's kind of fun. Uh, getting past the blank page is a little interesting, so I'll back up and take a look at other ones. Uh, a Docker image, Jekyll, .NET Desktop, Grunt, publish a Docker container. Here's some deployment things. Maybe I would want to deploy to Azure or AWS or um, Alibaba. Um, let me do some security stuff. Sonar Cloud's really interesting there. Maybe I want to do some continuous integration content, so I'll do an ASP.NET website. That's interesting. Uh, some automation, some pages. Uh, a Hugo build is really fun there, or a static site HTML. And I could also dig into these other categories to search for lots of other things. In this case, I'm going to look for, uh, what is it? Ah, uh, you're going to make me do it the hard way. They recently changed this from this being a, a kind of helpful startup to a completely blank file, and I'm like, but, 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 but help me start. So I'm just going to pick a random one. I will pick, uh, I don't know, this one. Cool. Now what makes a build on GitHub Actions is that it has a YAML file here in the .github slash workflows folder. Now I could choose to then enable or disable it in the settings, but it's just a YAML file in there. So I'm going to create a YAML file, and I'll call this docker build Kubernetes apply, Kubernetes start, and this will become my build file. Cool. Docker build Kubernetes start. Now our first section is when do we want to do this? What branches will kick off this? So yeah, I like the main branch. Let's do that. Um, we'll come back to pull requests, so I'll delete that here. And I'm going to add workflow dispatch. Now, the cool part about Workflow Dispatch is it gives us a manual trigger button. Have you ever been looking through your Git history and you see all those commits that say, kick off a build, kick it off again, kick it off again, kick it off again? Now, we can talk about Git Squash that will kind of help us remove those commits, but the cool thing about Workflow Dispatch is that we now have a run button up here, so we don't have to just commit code to kick it off. We can actually come in here and kick it. Cool. So I want to run on Ubuntu. I could choose to run on Mac OS or Windows as well, but I'm going to deploy this ASP.NET to uh, Linux instead. Now we've got some steps. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to check out all my code. So I've already now got a neutral environment. I don't have anything else installed here, and I just want to do this. So let's do docker build and push cube. CTL apply. Now, I want to run not just one command, but I want to run many commands. And the first command that we want to run is this, docker build dash t level up dev ops dot. Now, that dot sets the current directory so that we know here in our Docker file, we can pop open this Docker file, and we know that that aligns nicely with this, and it'll pull in all of these files. Excellent. Cool. So I've built my content, and I've tagged it on the way in. 
but um, I really want to tag it with my private repository. So, you know, my private repository is that because that's a secret and I want that nowhere close to my source control system. I've created some secrets here inside my settings. The repository wasn't quite empty. I created some secrets before, uh, that's not it. It's here, nope. Secrets, I'm looking right past it, secrets. They moved it recently and I'm like Bleh. I created some secrets previously. So I have my cube config, I pulled this out of my user profile, this is how I attached to my production Kubernetes cluster. Maybe your ops team has that and they're not gonna share it with you, that's fine. I set my Kubernetes URL, my username and password and URL to my private container registry. And so now I can use these secrets inside of my build to be able to do some really interesting things. So I wanna use this ACR URL. How do we use this? Let's come to the GitHub docs. And yep, I went and created all my settings. I came in here and I said, I would like a new thing. And I gave it a name and I gave it a value and I added the secret. So now I've got all these secrets, excellent. So next up, I want to use them and I use them with the dollar curly curly syntax. Good question, I've been doing this through the GUI so far. Is there a way that I can do this through the command line? Yes, that is a great question. Ask me again in 10 minutes. Because it'll be awesome. Okay, so we do want to use this secret. Let's use this secret, dollar curly curly secrets. ACR URL. And now we've got the uh, repository that we want stuck into this build file at runtime and this value will never end up in our source control. Cool. We also want to give it a version because best practice is not to use latest. So let's give it a version. V0.1.2. Uh, I don't want to hard code that. I'm going to say, let's say, github.sha. Now the cool part about this is this is the git hash of that commit. Yes, this isn't Semver, but this is a unique hash per build. Now I like to embed this git sha in my code as well, so I'll probably also embed it here in my um, layout down here in the footer with all the legal stuff. I'll say um, git sha and pull that out of code because then if I get a screenshot from my user that includes an error message, they don't know that they also gave me the version of the code that I need to reproduce their concern. That's cool. So yes, it's not Semver, but it is a very specifically unique version to this build and it will help me better discover the source of the problem that was created. Cool, docker build, docker push. Let's push this thing into our private container registry. Hmm, which registry? I don't know yet. Okay, so we probably need to add a step to log into docker. So let's come here and let's look for Docker login, and here's a good one. We can take a look at this thing. We can pull up the marketplace listing, which is actually really interesting. We can probably see not only the uh, best practices for using this, we can also probably see a lot of docs of how it works. We probably also have a reference to the GitHub repository that this action is built in. By the way, an action is just a bunch of files and a very specific um, YAML file, action.yaml, and that becomes a GitHub action. That's cool. So we could build our own GitHub actions if we wanted to. But in this case, I 
really only want this YAML right here. So I'm going to copy this and let's add it as a step after we get the latest code before we do our build. I need to indent it a little bit better and let's remove some of this mess. Okay. So what's the registry URL? Well, good thing I have a secret for that. Secrets.acr URL. Uh, what's my username? I happen to have a secret for that. ACR username. What is my password? Well, I happen to have a secret for that as well. ACR password. ECR, nope, I don't need that. And logout, yes, I would like to set it to logout. Now this doesn't log out at the end of this task in the build, but rather at the end of all of the steps in the build. What's it logging out? Well, I've just set a secret. I've logged into Docker. And if I was on a shared build host, I don't want the next build to be able to inherit my secret. So I want to make sure that I clear out that gunk. Now, one of the cool things about GitHub Actions is that I've got a specific VM for this build. And at the end of my build, that VM is going away. So I could probably leave this as false. But good code hygiene, I'm going to leave this as true. If I ever move this to a shared build host, maybe a build agent running in my, um, on my LAN and my corporate infrastructure, then I definitely do want to clear that out. So I'm, I've logged out. Excellent. So now when I push, I've got that content, and I can now um, get that image up into place. Next, kubectl apply-f k8s.yaml. We want to run that Kubernetes YAML file, get it started in our cluster. Now, if we wanted to do more specific builds of you know, cascading through environments, maybe we might want to pull in a tool like Octopus Deploy that allows us to do that. Or maybe we want to grab Helm and do a Helm apply in different environments from a dashboard. But we're just going to go old school here and just apply that into place. Cool. Apply it to where? Well, I'm going to come back here into my uh, marketplace again, and I will look for a uh, Kubernetes set context. Uh, spelling Kubernetes right. Cool. Let's look at this one. That looks good. Let's set that right there. Indented. I really wish that if you pasted it, it indented correctly, but that's fine. The cool part about this uh, task is that it can work with all kinds of different methodologies of how to connect to the cluster. Now, in this case, my methodology is uh, kubeconfig. So I will set that as my method here. And then what is my cube config? Well, good thing I have a secret for that. Secrets dot cube config. And that means that all the rest of this, all of the other methods I don't need. Cool. So now I've picked the correct cluster. I've now started my content there. But there's a few things here in this Kubernetes YAML file that we haven't done. <coughs> we very specifically created these replacement expressions to keep those secrets out of our source control and to be able to set runtime details, like the image label. OK, so let's come back into our GitHub Actions build. And let's do this. Now, here's where you might want to reach for um, YAML mod or Helm or I'm just going to go old school. I'm going to set without backup the string ACR URL with the secret for ACR URL globally. So it goes and finds all of the instances and replaces them all. Here's the AKS URL. I'll replace that with the secret. Here's the image label, I'll replace that with the secret. And I want to do that in the Kubernetes YAML file. Now, you could just replace it in place, pipe it to kubectl apply dash. In this case, I've chosen to replace it in this file directly. 
Now, I have chosen to do it here, not here. If I did it here, and if I say came back to my .docker ignore file, and I forgot, say, to add kds.yaml to my docker ignore file, then right here I would end up copying my secrets into my image. If you popped my image, you could get my deployment credentials. That's not real great. So I'm not going to do that here. I'm going to do it here. Once my Docker build is done and my image is pushed to my registry, I'm not even going to touch those secrets until I know that that image is already out of the way and I don't get my secrets embedded into my image. Cool. So we've got this build file. We, uh, on Linux, we check out our code, we log into Docker, we log into Kubernetes, we Docker build, which will do all of the steps here in our Docker file. We do, uh, that will do a .NET restore, build, test, publish, switch the other image and uh, set up our app. Then we uh, replace our expressions and start that inside of Kubernetes. Any questions here on this build file? Yep. Can you say that again? Ooh, good call. Where did I get kubectl? Was that software that I installed on my build agent? Should I have done some other task to be able to pull in kubectl? This is one of the things that uh, GitHub just has installed on all of their build agents. And so similar to Docker, I could just use it. But if I wanted to use a more exotic tool, yeah, I would either need to grab it from a bin folder or grab it from another repository. Um, in this case, though, it worked out really well. Um, GitHub actions installed software. They have a few things installed. Oh, I have to ask it what version of. Yeah, they have a few things installed on their build agents. Just a few. Just a few. Hold on, hold on. We're, there's, there's a few more. Hold on. There's, yeah, all of the things that I've needed have been pre-installed except for all the things that were more exotic that weren't pre-installed. Yeah. So yeah, if you go to run the command and it doesn't work, then um, yeah, app get install it. Great question. What other questions do we have here about the DevOps pipeline? Cool. So this is just a file in our repository. Let's save it. I gave it a cool name. I'm going to start the commit. Add build file, add DevOps build file, commit. Cool. Now, because we created this um, file inside the .github slash workflows directory, it's you know just a file inside of our uh, repository, git pull. Would you like to ask your question again? Ah. Good call. Yes, GitHub does have an API for creating and listing secrets. You can't get the value of secrets. Asterix, I was able to do it once. For the most part, this is a write-only system. So yes, you create the secret inside of GitHub Actions. You create the secret inside of Kubernetes. You create the secret inside of Octopus Deploy. And you forget it. You don't store it anywhere else. If ever you need to know it, you change it, which is probably a good practice anyway. 
go change your secret in GitHub Actions, change it in the place that needs to use it in that API, and then you're able to run with it there. Yeah, the, the GitHub CLI is really cool. Uh, they've actually been working on it quite a bit. And you can now um, do interesting things like creating new issues, approving pull requests, all from the command line. It's pretty amazing. Cool, so it's just a file in our repository, and we could continue messing with it here just as a file as well. But it's also a file in this very magic directory, so it kicked off a build. Now, we uh, putzed around for a little bit, so we didn't get to see all the things, but it uh, logged into Docker, it logged into Kubernetes, it did all of our build steps, it logged out, and uh, so now we have that site that previously was not running in Kubernetes, running inside of Kubernetes. Cool. Now it does take a while for DNS to propagate. Uh, depending on the ingress controller that you use and the DNS service that you use, that might be more or less. Um, <laughs> every time I call GoDaddy, they say it's uh, 24 to 72 hours, and I'm like, no, it's not. But yeah, we could browse to this URL and try to get to stuff, and it's not gonna resolve. Eh, I'm impatient. So let's use port forwarding to be able to reach into our cluster. Now we could port forward into a particular pod, we could port forward into a deployment and it'll just round robin pick a pod, we could port forward into a replica set, or we could port forward into service, let's do that. So we have this service, our level up DevOps service, we're only splitting that one spot of our ingress controller, so let's say kubectl, um, Port forward service slash level up DevOps. Port 80 on my local machine to port 80 inside that service. I know it's port 80 because here inside my Kubernetes YAML file, I said that's the port that it's listening on. But maybe I have something else running on port 80 on my local machine. So I'll port it, I'll say port 8080 on my local machine goes to port 80 inside the service. Cool, now that we've got that uh, running, we can come here to localhost8080, and we see our service. We invented that an hour ago. Woohoo! it deployed correctly! You ever get to the... You ever get to that spot where you've been working on this code feverishly for like a few hours, and, and, and then all of the tests finally go green, and it's like, And of course your coworkers are looking at you like, uh, what are you on? I just did the coolest thing ever. It was that, we got a website running in a container on Kubernetes. That's cool. Welcome to our, de our SLC DevOps Days website. Um, okay, this one's better. Now that was cool. One of the things that we built here was an automated process where every time we change anything, it will go rebuild that and redeploy it. Well, how do I know what version is deployed? Well, I've got this pod here, and if I say kubectl get, uh, describe that pod, it's gonna tell me all of the details about that pod. So here's all the steps of it pulling the image and which Docker image it used and um, some labels here. And it says app is level up DevOps. We set that in our Kubernetes YAML file and version is 36E549CB. So I need to check out 36E549C to be able to work on the exact version that is deployed right now. That was kind of cool. Kubernetes left me breadcrumbs of how to get back to where I needed to go to get to where uh, I could reproduce that customer issue. 
That was cool. Okay, one of the things that we set aside was pull requests. So let's come back to pull requests. Now, we want to do a pull request, but we may not want to do all of these steps. Maybe we don't want to deploy to Kubernetes. Maybe we don't want to push our image to Docker. Now, we definitely could say pull request and branches and specify those branches. And then here we could say if and give it some condition about when I'm doing it based on the GitHub branch that is currently being built. But our, uh, our pull request build is going to be substantially different. So I'm going to create a brand new build here. New file, docker build pr.yaml. OK. So docker build a PR. We want to do this on all the branches that are not main. And we want to do pull request on all branches. Now, why do we have two? Well, for internal collaborators who are part of this project, they're probably going to create a separate branch. Maybe this is a feature branch. They'll call it, I don't know, feature slash foo, and, they'll, and this build will catch that one. It's looking for all the branches that aren't main. And then external contributors, the ones that are creating pull requests, they'll fork this code into their repository. They'll make some pull requests, and then they'll create a pull request for, uh, for our stuff. They're going to catch this one. So this is for internal collaborators. This one is for external collaborators. We want to build for each of them. Now, granted, once the internal collaborator finishes their build, they're probably going to create a pull request, and yeah, then it'll catch here too. But uh, it's nice for them to know straight away what's, um, if there are any concerns before they create the pull request. We still have the workflow dispatch that will give us that go button, which is really nice. And now what do we want to do? Well, I don't really want to run it on my production cluster, so I'll delete that line. Now, because I'm not running it in Kubernetes, I probably don't need to log into Kubernetes, so I'll delete that line. So that probably means I don't need to create the secret, so I'll delete that line. And I don't really even want to push it to my registry. I don't want somebody accidentally happening upon this pull request build and deciding that one's the latest and running it. So I won't even push it to my registry, which means I don't even need to log into Docker. To that end, I don't even want to put my registry URL there. I'll just Say level up dev apps dash PR. There is our pull request build. Now, we're still going to do all of the steps inside of our Docker file. We're still going to restore all of our dependencies. We're still going to run build, test. If we have any failing unit tests, the build will stop there. We'll publish this into our second container. We might have another container to be able to run integration tests. And so we're doing all of the pieces that we need to. We're just not pushing that image anywhere. We're just saying, OK, it succeeded. I think this is probably ready to go. Now, if we had maybe Sauce Labs tests that we wanted to, maybe we would want to push it to an alternate registry and then maybe launch things. Or maybe we just want to say docker, docker run dash d this thing, and because I'm running it in daemon mode, then I get my command back. So then I say sauce labs ctl go do it. And that runs my integration tests. And then I'll have to go find that image and go kill it. So maybe I kept the PID from this. And you can see how the builds might start getting interesting there. But I can just choose to add additional steps as I have them to be able to do other interesting tasks. Now, in this case, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to Docker build. Cool. Another interesting thing that we might choose to do here is that here in our repository, we have this nice readme file that introduces people to our repository. But it could be cool to have a status badge showing them uh, what's the uh, version in our repository and what's the build status. 
So I'm going to come back into that build and I'll take a look at this and I'll say create status badge. Copy that status badge markdown and I will set it here in my readme right here. That looks like a good spot. Cool. Okay, so we've got our readme, we've got our PR build. Let's close these and let's take a look at this. Ooh, good thing I ignored that Kubernetes YAML file. If I hadn't have done that, I might have leaked secrets into production. Definitely don't want to do that. Let's stage that file. I've got my changes to my Docker readme file with that um, new status badge. That's cool. This one is a brand new file. I'm going to spend a lot of time here in my commit window kind of telling the story that I want to for my fellow developers. This is what they'll see coming through, and this is you know, the entirety of my change. Now, in this case, maybe I want to split this into many commits. I've done quite a few things here, but I'm going to say add PR build and status badge and just kind of ignore the I forgot the security thing. If I wanted to get fancy, I could amend the previous commit and um, do things, but I'm good with that. Cool. So last time I did a git push from here. And this time I'm going to do a git push inside of VS Code. I can come in here and I can say push. And that will launch that code into GitHub. So the cool thing about this is that because we have a Kubernetes YAML file in our GitHub slash workflows directory. And because we just changed something in this repository, we just kicked off a build. Last time we went in this way. This time let's go in this way. I'm going to go into the action, go into the build. I'll look at that particular stage. And now it'll show me all the things. So it's uh, pulling my base image. It's now in uh, pulling all of the images that I referenced from my Docker file. It looks like that is complete. So now we're going to log into Docker. It looks like that went great. And then, oh, we're still pulling. OK, now we're in our Docker file. We just did our .NET restore, so we got all of our dependencies. We might choose to cache this if we're in a Go project and the dependencies are this big, but I kind of like pulling some vert details. We're going to build. It looks like our build succeeded. Excellent. We have no unit tests, so we have no failing unit tests. So that succeeded. Now we'll, sw we'll publish, switch over to our other image. We're now outside of our Docker file, pushing that final image up to our private GitHub registry. And uh, then we'll start that, we'll replace the contents inside the Kubernetes YAML file. We'll start that in Kubernetes. And we have another green build. Woohoo! On any code change, we will now deploy the latest version up to Kubernetes. <sighs> that was fun. Now, did it deploy the latest version? Well, one of the things that I like to do here is um, at the end of my Kubernetes, or at the end of my um, PR build, not my PR build, my regular build, I might say curl and go hit the public URL of that. Well, yeah, that's definitely a secret. So secrets.aks uh, URL. And if I get a 200 back, I know that my website is probably running. I don't have any major configuration errors. Um, I might also want to kick off my um, Selenium tests or my Cypress tests to be able to validate that system works as expected. In this case, let's go look at it manually. Now, the more that I do this, the more I'm like, well, could I add that to the thing? Eh, yeah. Um, so I want to do kubectl get all, and now I see that I've got my two pods in place. Uh, they're only 84 seconds old, so this is looking good. Let's say uh, kubectl describe that pod, and its current version is 6f510a, and 6F501A is the current commit. It deployed successfully. Maybe I want to add that as a build step. So ultimately, now we can start to expand this build to match whatever business logic we need. Do we need to kick off additional unit tests? Do we need to kick off load tests? 
Do we need to promote this to another environment if deploying here succeeded? We can start to add these as commands here, or if we want to cruise through the marketplace, we can come back into um, our file and we can edit it. And now we have the marketplace where we can search for more plugins and continue to add there. Ultimately, we can now build a build that is as intense or as feature rich as we want, doing all of the different steps, versioning our assets, perhaps we build multiple containers based on this repository, or perhaps we're only matching a particular path in our repository to build a specific container. But we can now expand this build to do lots of interesting things. Now the cool part, we started with nothing. We scaffolded a website. We built up a .git ignore file talking about best practices. What are the five things we need to ignore? Downloads, secrets, user files, temp files, built files. What's the one we need to add to our Docker ignore file? Non-prod non files, yeah. Our Docker login fit into the secrets, you're right. So we did our Docker ignore file and our git ignore file. We built up our Docker file. We leveraged uh, layers to be able to make local builds faster. What else did we do? What was the other best practice that we used here in our Docker file? Multi-stage builds. We did that so that our um, build tools wouldn't end up in our production container. Once we had our build file complete, we were able to scaffold out a bunch of Kubernetes YAML files that built up our deployment that launched a bunch of pods, built up our service that was a load balancer across them, built up our ingress that allowed us to be able to route traffic in, and then we pushed all that up to GitHub. From there, we built up our DevOps pipeline that was able to just really quickly dig into all the things. We noticed that the only real things that our build is doing is um, Docker build and Kubernetes apply. All of the logic of our build is now in our Docker file. That's really cool. And so at that point, now we can start to iterate this build and maybe add additional features. Maybe we want to set in other environment variables, pull in Kubernetes roles or persistent volumes, and we can start to expand this to be whatever we want. Now what's really interesting about this build is we did Docker and Kubernetes. We didn't do Redshift or EKS, we just did Kubernetes. So this build will work equally well on Redshift as it will K3S, it'll work equally well on Azure as it will on AWS, it'll work equally well with .NET as it will with Node or with React or Go. The only difference is that here in our Docker file, we may choose to run Node commands or Python commands right here. But I would invite you to take this repository and swap in the build commands for your project, swap in the source code files for your project, and see if you can get your project into a container and deploy it onto Kubernetes. We were able to do this in an hour. I bet you can do it in a day on the project that you're looking at too. If you find interesting places where you get stuck or you want to celebrate your success, hit me up on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich or on Mastodon at Rob Rich at Hashiderm. Io, and this code is online right now on GitHub. You can get to it really easily at robrich.org. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Any questions I didn't answer in all of that? Yeah, what's your favorite color? What's my favorite color? <laughs> green. It's when the builds go green. Did you see the yellow car in the parking lot? No. Yeah, that one's mine too. <laughs> Is there a question out here? Does this require my Kubernetes cluster to be public facing? In this case it is, but it doesn't need to be. I just need to be able to route to it. So maybe I add my GitHub Actions agent to my uh, cloud's LAN or maybe I'm using a different build that is inside my cloud's LAN. If I'm using AWS, maybe I'm using AWS cloud build. And yeah, the YAML is going to be ever so slightly different than this, but the majority of it, the Docker file is going to be pretty much the same. 
And at the end of it, I'm just going to kubectl apply into that cluster instead. In this case, it was public, but it doesn't need to be. Great question. Yes? Yes, how would this build change if my build agent was actually inside of Kubernetes, if it was a container running in Kubernetes? Now we're getting into Docker inception, which is really interesting, Docker and Docker, or Kubernetes and Docker, because we kind of have to run Docker commands inside of our Docker image. And that's definitely possible. Maybe our build agent is a trusted image inside of our Kubernetes cluster, but if it is a trusted image inside of our cluster, Maybe we want a separate build cluster so that it can't reach out into other pods running in our cluster. That would be kind of build. I, kind of weird. I kick off a build and I'm able to hack production. But ultimately, you know, it's pretty much the same. We saw that really the only file, the only commands that we're doing in our DevOps pipeline is, you know, Docker build and kubectl apply. You can do that from inside a Kubernetes trusted container just as easily as you can do it from a VM. Yeah. This talk used to do um, Azure DevOps. And the interesting thing was, yeah, the secret management was ever so slightly different, and the YAML file was slightly different, but the principles were the same. Yes? Good question. What's my experience with self-hosted runners? Would I recommend it? In most cases, a self-hosted runner will give you additional security, but maybe more headaches. You know, the whole reason that we outsource things to the cloud is we want them to manage it. Part of the beauty of GitHub Actions is you get a certain amount of build minutes per month for free, and I kind of like using somebody else's money. If I had specific uh, requirements around uh, data sovereignty or uh, build security, uh, and an S bomb and uh, um, an S bomb wasn't sufficient. S bomb and attestations of my build were not sufficient. Then a, a private agent might give me that kind of level of comfort and control to say, no, this source code never ever left my firewall. In most cases, though, I don't want to patch the build agent. I'd rather use theirs. That was a brilliant question, though. If you're in um, a regulated environment, build agents can be really handy, local build agents. Yes? Could I complain about container D and Docker? Could I com complain? The sky is falling. <laughs> Kubernetes removed Docker. Um, this is not directly related to your question, but I'm going to come back to it because this is fun. Kubernetes and Docker grew up separately. They ended up growing together because they kind of have mutually beneficial goals. But Docker is not the only runtime that, or not the only build engine that you can use to build containers. And Kubernetes is not the only runtime that you can use to run containers. As Kubernetes and Docker were kind of growing together, Kubernetes added this Docker shim, where it would actually run Docker commands to be able to accomplish things. In time, we noticed that, well, you know, Docker does lots of things. It does run containers, but it also builds them, and it also does all these other things. And, and we don't need that much stuff inside of Kubernetes if we only want to use this much of it. So they removed the Docker shim out of Kubernetes, and the sky did not fall. If you're using a supported version of Kubernetes, Docker is no longer in it. So what's the difference then? What did they use? 
Well, the cool part about containers is over time, we created the Open Container Initiative, OCI. And the cool part is if you have an OCI compliant image, it will run on any OCI compliant runtime. Docker is a great way to build OCI compliant images. Kubernetes is a great way to run OCI compliant images, but they're not the only ones. And another one to be able to run them is container D. So you can use either Docker's engine inside of Kubernetes, or you can use container D inside of Kubernetes, or you can use run C inside of Kubernetes. What's the difference between them? At this level, eh. As you peel the onion, Docker gives you the ability to build. Um, container D kind of doesn't until you do. Um, but for the most part, that's the biggest difference that we'll see as we start peeling the onion. For now, you can treat them as synonyms. That was a brilliant question. I love that. That was cool. Yes? Yeah, so should I move away from Docker like Kubernetes did? Is Docker a dirty word now? Docker is definitely the easy button, but it is not the only way to build containers. If you, uh, and not the only way to run them. I really enjoy uh, Docker's um, Docker Compose file because it's really good at identifying dependencies and starting them in the right order. By comparison, in Kubernetes, it assumes that they're already running. So there is no like wait for that thing to be ready. And so I'll use a Docker Compose file in development. It avoids all that complexity of services and pods and ingress and all that mayhem. And I'll kind of pay, poke at my containers and make my containers work correctly. And then in production, I'll use Kubernetes where I have all of those levels of abstraction that allows me to uh, allocate secrets to different teams and create different uh, roles of responsibility. Now, it's not perfect. Maybe if I have a bug in my Kubernetes YAML file or a bug in my Docker Compose file, it's difficult to find it that way. But Docker Compose is such a simpler mechanism. But Podman, um, uh, Micro KS, Minikube, um, Rancher Desktop are all great alternatives if you decide that Docker Desktop is not the right flavor for you. I still use Docker. That was a great question. Yes? Yeah, good call. Why didn't I say in here, um, come in here to the Docker build task and the Docker push task and the, um, why didn't I use those? Because that was one line. And using the task would have been that many lines. I find the Docker build command to be a little bit more legible. Personal preference. If you like the uh, task, then that's, that's totally fine too. I find this to be not only a little bit simpler, but also a little bit more discoverable. If you're not familiar with GitHub Actions and you don't really get what's going on here, this still makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, what if I need to log this change? What if I need to go grab my um, test results and upload them into my dashboard? I might add that. Um, there's a cool task here, and you could SCP them into an interesting place, but it kind of gets a little bit voodoo. Um, but there's a task here that is actually really ele elegant. Um, Upload build artifact. And so you can go grab the um, test results, the report, uh, 
XML file. You might grab uh, other build results and submit them. Maybe you're also grabbing your Anchor um, image scan results and uploading them. And so you know, publishing those to the dashboard to be able to get a more auditable history here. Now GitHub does a pretty good job of that. And so if it's sufficient to come in here and say, there's my builds, and by the way, what commit kicked it off, if that's sufficient for you, it's done. And you don't need to build something else. But if you do want more, then there's definitely options to do that. Yes? Yeah, so in Jenkins, I have downstream jobs. I have a thing that will, I don't know, kick off when this job finishes to be able to do extra things. There's two ways to do that in GitHub Actions. The first is, this is a stage. And so I could add a second stage that is, I don't know. Oh, I haven't edited it yet. Let me edit it here. Um, I have this build stage. That's why we click through build when we did it. And so maybe I don't want to deploy here. I want to create a whole separate release stage and do some steps there. I could definitely do that. That's one way to go. The other way is we triggered based on a push to a branch or based on the workflow dispatch, the manual go button right here, run workflow. But you could also trigger off other things, like the other build finished, I got a webhook, closed a PR. You know, all of the different events inside of GitHub, you could trigger your action based on those instead. So that cron expression, that that's why you haven't moved to the cloud, is you haven't figured out how to run that cron expression on a schedule. Make it a GitHub action and have it kick off on a schedule. That was a great question. I love that. Awesome. Well, this has been a lot of fun. You can grab the code online right now at GitHub and find me here at the event or on Twitter. And let's continue the conversation. Thanks for coming.